All right, everybody. <clears throat> Good evening. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed their holiday, little holiday weekend there. We um, so getting in before we get into class as usual. I'll just try to give you guys an opportunity if you have any questions about anything uh, over the last couple of chapters or quizzes or anything like that. I looked at the grade today, uh, not too bad. Like I mentioned on Facebook earlier. Few of you uh, haven't uh, haven't signed up for your Canvas or haven't logged into your Canvas or, or got gotten on there to do your quizzes. So, um, or you know both both of those. Some haven't uh, logged in and some haven't just taken their quizzes. So, uh, make sure you're you're getting in there and doing that. You don't want to get behind on your quizzes. <clears throat> so, any questions from uh, from these other chapters before we get started? All right. So the uh this this chapter coming up is medical legal ethical. That's kind of what we're we'll get into with um we'll get in we'll get in, that's kind of transitions us out of the you know preparatory stuff there towards the beginning just kind of you know uh do's and don'ts and and safety type stuff and of course with medical legal obviously you know they're and ethical there's a lot of uh a lot of things that we have to do uh that kind of sets a tone for a lot of things that we have to do but the second half of tonight is chapter six which will be body system so we start we start medical stuff okay so we're kind of we're getting we're transitioning from the from the prep stuff and we're going to get into the medical stuff <clears throat> so again please uh please be reading your chapters i know some of you still are working on books and that sort of thing but um you know as soon as you get the opportunity you need to read your chapters and uh, as some of you may have seen on your quizzes it'll tell you what the where to reference what you missed so when you see what you missed you can go back and look at the chapter and and see what that is and that's a good way to kind of you know dive off into those weak areas and and get some more information on on that on that part of it so if nobody has any questions we'll get into it uh like i said with uh chapter six i'm sorry chapter four being um medical legal and ethical a lot of you know, a lot of room for error here. There's, or I'm sorry, there's not a lot of room for error here. There is quite a bit, uh, you know, a lot of people over the years have gotten, gotten in some serious trouble. Okay. Um, you know, I've been, uh, I've been witness to some pretty bad paramedics, pretty bad basics and all sorts of stuff just did some really unethical stuff uh you know both on the medical side and the legal side and uh you know really put patients in more harms in more harms way than good so uh it, it really can be very detrimental to you your career so if it, if you're not uh it, 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 so again talking about those of you that are cops and firemen and things like that you know uh that sort of thing can can come back on you just like anything just like, uh, you know, if you do something um, detrimental at a, at a fire or a rescue scene or something like that or at a, at a crime scene, it'll be, you know, it can come back on you in court. So um, some of the things that we're going to go over tonight, we'll try to hit our stress a little bit more than others. But uh, it all is all very important. And, and it's it's done almost. Yeah, you know, it's it, just about every call, you know, you have to sometimes you have to make a medical, ethical, legal decision or use that part of part of that to make your decision uh, all the time. OK, so uh, it may be pretty seamless once you start, once you get used to it. But uh, there are times where, you know, especially when we have kids and people who have questionable uh, mental capacities and things like that. You know, we really have to you know walk a fine line, you know whether or not we uh, we take their rights into our own hands. Okay. So we'll talk about consent, refusal of care, confidentiality, advanced directives, tort and criminal actions, evidence preservation, and statutory responsibilities tonight, as well as 
mandatory reporting, ethical principle, moral obligations, and end-of-life issues. So again, the laws differ from, you know, state to state, location to location, uh, you know, some, not necessarily the law, but also, you know, like we mentioned before with the um, rules and regulations for, for, you know, ambulances or trauma care regions or something like that, they, you know, they may have different, uh, different applicable uh, rules and regulations and laws that um, preclude you from doing certain things. So as it says there, above all else, above all else, do no harm. Okay, and that's what we mentioned that a couple of times here uh, recently. That's you know that's kind of our motto, right? Do no harm. So do no further harm uh, than what has already been done to the patient. Provide all your care in good faith, right? How would you want somebody to care for you or your or your family members, right? Provide proper, consistent care. Be compassionate. And maintain your composure. Uh, you know, there, it comes a time where, you know, you'll be pushed to that, you know, you'll, your, your composure will be tested. And so, uh, it really is, you know, you always have to keep that patient centered, uh, care at the forefront and make sure that that, you know, what you're doing is, is in their best interest. So duty to act, uh, if you're employed by the agency as an EMR and, and you are dispatched to the scene of an accident or illness, you have a duty to act, okay? It's under under the law. So if you are, um, you know, if you're driving down the road, you know, and in your POV, personal own vehicle, and you happen to roll up on an accident or something, you know, it's it's questionable depending on what uh, – what your what the situation is, but you may also have a duty to act. Uh, so that usually when you get higher in licensure and things like that, and you you can do uh, you can do more things. Uh, usually that falls a little bit more highly on uh, on those people. But nonetheless, we we give you this information so that you understand that um, that if for some reason you are there and you are qualified to render aid and you don't, then there's the potential for you to, uh, for someone to go after the fact, even to go, Hey, you know, I know, I know him and he, he's a, he's an EMR. He, he didn't do anything. He didn't even attempt to do anything, you know? So that could again, come out in court and, and, you know, you could be held accountable for that. Again, within the limits of your training, okay, and available equipment, obviously, um, but nonetheless, uh, you want to act in good faith. So standard of care is the care and manner in which you must act or behave. So essentially, it's what uh, it's what's best for the patient at that time and, and what you have the ability to do. Uh, but also you must provide care that is reasonable, prudent person with similar training will provide under similar circumstances. Okay. So it's essentially what we're doing now, right? We're setting, we're setting a standard. We're giving you a set way to, uh, you know, assess and treat patients um, at the EMR level. Okay. So you're expected after you get done with this class and if you get national registry or whatever, that, you go forward and you you're able to provide that standard of care okay so if we don't if we uh you know if we don't act within that that standard of care you know we're not treating our patients to to, to that standard um then we're you know that holding back or either just uh, negligently, which we'll get into, uh, doing that. So doing that, you know, for wrongful purposes, withholding care, things like that, that that's going to be detrimental to you. So scope of care is defined by the the standards uh, set forth by DOT, like we mentioned before, medical protocols, standing orders, and online medical direction. Again, the majority of you are not going to have the other the last two. Um, just in general, you don't you don't very you don't see very many EMRs with standing orders and in, in medical direction. Uh, however, we do have, you know, the things that we learn through this standardized training course, 
that gives you um, the information that you need in order to proceed and and go forward, you know, in and only this scope of of training. So treating a patient ethically means doing so in a manner that conforms to accepted professional standards of conduct, right? So it, it's under it's kind of expected, you know, the, the public expects us, you know, if we're a professional rescuer, a professional medical provider at any level, that we're going to stay up to date on our skills and knowledge, uh, reviewing your performance and assess uh, techniques, evaluate response times, follow up on patient outcomes, take continuing education classes, participate in quality improvement activities. And, you know, really, uh, that's probably one of the biggest things, we, you know, people have been talking about, uh, have asked about, oh, do I need to take National Registry? Well, I don't, I don't really need that. I'm not going to work on an ambulance or, you know, whatever. And that's fine, all right, if you don't want to do that. However, when you do, when you take that test and you keep up your National Registry, it's one of those things that's kind of in the back of your mind every two years for you to do, to do these things, right? Stay up to date on skills and knowledge. Take continuing education classes. It forces you to do that. So in order to keep that certification, you have to do those things. Uh, so though that's probably the best, one of the best reasons uh, for a lot of people is to kind of take the guesswork out of some of it and, and you can uh, try to stay up to date and be a better provider um, you know, throughout the course of your career and, uh, and not have to worry about it. And again, like I said, just, uh, that's just life, life, you know, we get busy, we get, uh, we get, have a lot of stuff going on and we're like, Oh, I don't want to go to do this class. I don't want to take this thing. I don't want to go to that training at the fire department, you know, whatever. But, you know, and that's kind of how we, where we may fall into if we don't have something watch, uh, looking over our shoulder, keeping us in check like that. So ethical behavior requires honesty, uh, always provide complete and correct reports to other EMS providers, never change a report except to correct an error. You know, these are, this is where, you know, we get into some serious ramifications when we start uh, doing things like that. There's a lot of other laws that you'll never hear about, you never know about that are out there that, especially in the medical field, uh, that are pretty commonplace. And, you know, there are people that have been raked over the coals big time by defense attorneys and everything and, and, and uh, juries and everything else uh, because they, you know, went back and falsified documentation. They, you know, they told somebody one thing and somebody else another. You know, they uh, said something different on the radio than what they, you know, actually reported or something like that. And a lot of that stuff is recorded now, you know, so all of our radio transmissions that we have in this county are recorded, you know, so uh, all the telephone, telephones and dispatch are recorded, you know, so um, you tell, you tell somebody not to, not to respond to the scene or something like that. And there's clearly a need for them to be there or, or vice versa. We send somebody home or something like that. And they, they're needed there that, that could come back and, and bite you uh, if you did that maliciously, you know, that was uh, for some reason you wanted um, you didn't want that care to be provided in the appropriate manner, and uh, you tried to hide that. So, excuse me. Consent for treatment is the essentially you know what we go by for um, legally being able to uh, render aid to the, to our patients. And usually it's in one of two ways, two, three ways, expressed and implied consent. So expressed consent is the patient essentially just says, hey, uh, you know, I called you, my family member called you, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I feel bad, I feel sick, you know, whatever it is, you know, please, please treat me, please transport me to the hospital, okay? Uh, in order for them to do that, uh, and it can be verbal or nonverbal, but in order for them to do that, they must be of legal age and able to make a rational decision. Okay. Legal age, usually 18 years old. Um, so that's one of those things that, you know, we, we need to be cognizant of, you know, early on, Hey, how old are you? Uh, 
you know, asking that we're, we're going to get into some ways that we clarify mental status. Okay, when we get into in, in, down further into uh, patient assessment, but that's essentially what uh, what that is helping to do is helping us to decide whether or not this patient is able to answer my questions appropriately. Okay. Things as simple as, hey, sir, ma'am, what's, you know, what's your name? Okay, you know where you're at? You know what day it is? You know, little things like that, person, place, and time help us to kind of get an idea that, hey, they're with it. They they understand what's going on, and we can uh, we can usually go from there. And, um, and then, you know, of course, depending on their age, if they look younger, uh, we can kind of clarify that maybe by – identification check or have law enforcement, you know, get their name and social date of birth, different things like that, and run them through a, through an applicable database and see if they come, come up with something. Uh, or like I said, looking at their driver's license or military ID or, you know, student ID, something like that, uh, might give us a better indication as to their age. So if we're right there on the line, or we're not really sure, <clears throat> excuse me, we're in an environment where, you know, we might be, two miles in the woods, you know, and it's some person that's, uh, you know, kind of giving us the runaround, doesn't want to go to the hospital, but um, they look kind of young and they keep saying they're 18, but we're like, mm, I don't know. It's, it's not, we're not really sure. Let's, we might need to get law enforcement out here and, and talk to them a little bit more and really confirm before we uh, do that. Now, again, this is for an express consent patient. That's usually going to be uh, somebody that we're, we can we can speak with and talk to they're not in such a bad way or they're not unconscious or anything like that <clears throat> however if we do have those <clears throat> that's where implied consent comes in so if we have those patients who are obviously underage or we find that are underage um or who are mentally incapable of making uh decisions for themselves so they're unconscious or again, they have some type of mental disability, then we uh, apply that treatment under implied consent, okay? And that implied consent is essentially what we were mentioning earlier is what would uh, a prudent, uh, you know, reasonable person want done in that case, okay? So what most prudent, reasonable people if they had a large laceration on their head and they were unconscious, they would probably want somebody to take care of them, right? So that's kind of where we're going with that. So if you're, you know, when you're asking yourself, you know, should I, do I need to, you know, do this, do that, treat them, transport them? That's, that's kind of the, the basis that you're working off of. Again, going back to the minors, uh, again, under the law, minors are not considered capable of speaking for themselves. Uh, so not to say that we're not going to speak to them. So if you have somebody who's 17, we're not going to speak to them like a child or, you know, talk past them or something like that. However, when it comes to decisions of typically when it comes to decisions of transport or if they're refusing treatment, uh, to some degree. So, I mean, if we come across a child who's 17 years old, who, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, was driving and, they were in a vehicle accident and they're refusing treatment. Sorry, I understand that you are driving here, but unfortunately you can't make the decision not to go to the hospital, not, not to go to the hospital. So we are, um, we're going to have to get consent from the parents, uh, before we do that. And, um, and so we, and we do that often. That happens all the time. So again, like I said, if if we uh, if we have emergency, we need if emergency treatment needs to be conducted, then we have to wait until a parent or legal guardian consents to the treatment. <clears throat> Usually, it's not a big deal. You typically they're there. Uh, sometimes we have implied consent with, um, so like your child is on a vacation in Florida with your best friend and their child, right? And so, you know. Everybody knows everybody. You consent. You basically consented for them to to give 
implied consent. We may talk to you on the phone um, and talk to the adult that's there that's in that they're in their custody and um, and we'll go from there. And usually that's that's a pretty good basis to go off of. So if permission can't be quickly obtained, do not hesitate to give appropriate medical care. So again, if it's if it's a life or death issue, uh, we're definitely going to render care uh, uh, more so, more so than we would than not. So, so consent with with patients with a mental illness is again, this is like I said, it's a pretty uh, fine line. Sometimes uh, you have people who are very aware that they have. Uh, some mental illness. Uh, however, the, and they will they will be just fine for a little bit in order to answer your questions, and then they are flipping out the re, you know right after that. So it, it, sometimes it, it's just a, like I said, it's a really thin line we have to walk. Uh, you know there there are times where we. Everybody with me? There you are. All right. Okay. All right. It said I left there for a second. So, uh, <clears throat> so the those patients will sometimes those some of those those mental patients will uh, toy with you. Sometimes they will, you know, kind of just go all around the world with their with their uh with their speech and different outbursts and things like that so you really have to kind of take each patient individually and sometimes you kind of have to dig a little bit in your questioning to try and get them get to understand whether or not they really are responding appropriately or not uh or whether or not they're just you know they're just being rude and, and belligerent uh, you know, we get this with drunk people, people who are high. Uh, sometimes we get this with people who are in uh, diabetic you know, type emergencies where they have a reduced level of consciousness. <clears throat> so, um, you know, they may be right there on the cusp of consciousness and not really speaking appropriately and answering questions appropriately. And, you know, a lot of times we end up just taking those people and, and doing and, and providing that level of care necessary in order to get them to that, to a point to where they can. And, um, or we just end up transporting them and then in route, they realize that they've been transported and they all of a sudden they don't want to go. And we're going to get into that in a second. Like it says, don't uh, don't hesitate to get law enforcement involved. Uh, you know, we get that fairly regularly, where we have to go and just kind of stand by with the ambulance and make sure that that they are um, that the patient understands that you know they need to go with them or you know somebody is going to end up taking them regardless. And so they usually they usually have a uh, different outlook after that, but. So again, the, a competent adult has a legal right to refuse treatment. Okay, so like we mentioned before, they're they're alert and oriented to person, place, and time. They know what's going on. They can answer your questions appropriately. They can have a huge cut on their arm. They could be, you know, be very sick or whatever. You know, we can't force them to do anything. Okay, it's. Uh, it's kidnapping after that, after, you know, at that point, if they are, if they are, are a competent adult, that's kidnapping. So it, there's no two ways about it. Okay. If you are just, uh, you may be super passionate about it. You may be super, you know, concerned for their well being, And you are absolutely 110% correct that that patient needs care. They need help. Okay. But if they refuse, that's it. There is there is no forcing them in the back of the ambulance. There is no asking me as a law enforcement officer to to force them to get in the back of the ambulance or whatever. Okay, um, you know, like I said, with some of these people who have questionable mental status, then I, I don't have a problem talking. You know, trying to work work them into the back of the ambulance. But when they are when they are of a consenting competent adult, 
that there's, it's a no-go. Okay. Now, plenty of times has an ambulance. I will tell you the ambulance has hung around around the corner or, um, waited, kind of waited long enough, just hung out long enough until that person passed out, uh, or had a change in their mental status to where they were, um, you know, were not compliant. They weren't, you know, acting competently. And, you know, they usually know that. So they just kind of hang out for a little while and wait for that to happen. And then they treat them. Okay. Uh, or we get a call back in, you know, 10, 15 minutes and somebody says, Hey, they're, they're passed out now, or, you know, they're, they're acting all crazy and belligerent and all this other stuff, you know? So literally it could be 10 minutes ago, we can't transport you. Okay. 10 minutes later, Hey, it's good to go. All right. So again, like I said, it's a very fine line and you just have to uh, take each patient uh, as they come. And you know, that's kind of some of these things you see here at the bottom. That's really what we, we try our best to, to give them all the information we can help them understand, listen, this is, this is what we need. This is why we're, we want you to do or we want you to do. This is why you need to go to the hospital. This is why you need to get treated. You know, it's, it's really bad. Sometimes it takes family members uh, to try to, you know, talk to them. They'll just listen to them. They know them, friends, family members, things like that. Um, you know, and sometimes they'll let you do certain things. So, you know, oh, don't wrap my arm so tight, but, you know, you can put that gauze pad on it or whatever, and I'll hold it on there. Okay. Meet me halfway, right? So it it really just depends. There's a lot of different uh, people out there, and everybody has a different view on what EMS does and why we're there and all this other stuff. So, all right, patient refusal should be documented on your patient care uh, record according to agency protocols. Typically, it's going to be the ambulance that really does a lot of this stuff. Uh, most fire departments don't do patient refusals anymore. We used to do that uh, where first responders got there, EM, you know, EMTs from the fire department, things like that, got there, and they said, oh, yeah, I'm good now. I don't want to go to the hospital. And the fire department would go, okay, here, sign here, appreciate it, and then they would cancel the ambulance, no big deal. Um uh, however, and, and so if your agency does that, you need to make sure that you have some type of written documentation, a signature from them, something stating that they don't want to go. Uh, that's just a good uh, way to cover your own butt from an agency standpoint and a personal standpoint and uh, help protect you and your license and your department and, and your city and county and all that. So. <clears throat> So advanced directives, advanced directives are essentially what you have uh, specified as a competent human being, a competent person that once uh, you become unable to make decisions for yourself, okay, uh, then your, your wishes are documented legally, okay? Uh, so again, you've probably heard of people going on, you know, they, they have advanced directives, so we can't do CPR or we can't put them on a ventilator, you know, so there's varying degrees of advanced directives. Uh, but again, at some point while they were competent, they, you know, usually terminally ill patients, obviously cancer patients, things like that, that have terminal diagnosis will go uh, ahead with an attorney and a doctor and, they will make those plans um, based off of a lot of different things, R religion, um, you know, upbringing, you know, just the the advancement of their disease or illness. So, and we have to respect that, you know, like I said, there's been plenty of times where we've been, I mean, just chomping at the bit and ready to do CPR and, uh, you know, provide care, do all sorts of stuff and, you know, in the, the relative or something like that will come in there and go, no, nope, sorry. Or the, the, uh, home health nurse, things like that will come in there and go, no, he has an advanced directive. It's, it's in date and all this other stuff. And we can't have that. So, Hey, uh, yes. yo, on a, 
uh, it's like if you respond to one and you know they're not breathing doesn't really have a pulse or anything like that and a family member says they have a dnr do you we really need to see it or can we just go off what the family member said yeah, so you definitely need to, you, you have to see it. That's kind of what I was getting at or going towards there was uh, it needs to be uh, signed. It needs to be in date. You, typically, these uh, living wills and advanced directives have a shelf life. So they typically only give them for like a month at a time, you know, and things like that. So it's really, it's really towards the end. Uh, when those things are enacted and uh, they want them to be, they, they really, they really need to be in a state where they can't, uh, you know, they can't uh, speak for themselves. And it's usually very late in their, um, in their diagnosis. So they want to have, or in their treatment. So they want to have, um, they only want to have them set up for a short period of time, a few weeks, months, something like that. And so you you need to see it, be able to look at it, and usually it's it's pretty cut and dry, you know. It it, it outlines what you can and can't do, and then um, it'll you know of course it'll tell you it has all the patient information on there, and it should be signed by attorney and physicians and all that stuff, and probably notarized, and then it has, um, it has the the exp expiratory date on there. So again, it's one of those things too where you know the family member hands you that and it's expired by a day, sorry, ma'am, I have a duty to act, okay? I have a duty to act and provide a certain level of, tr uh, certain, uh, level of care, and that's what we're about to do. Uh, I'm sorry. I know you don't, you may not want us to do that, or he may not want us to do that, um, but however, that's, that's what we have to do at this time. And so, you know, it, it, I've been there where, you know, they said, okay, we're going to do the, the minimal amount possible given our, you know, given our um, duty to act and, and, and our capabilities on scene, you know, they may still end up passing or they, st they may still end up, you know, with the same result, but that's, uh, you know, that's usually on the paramedic and things like that were, are usually uh, ones that are going to make that call. But um, I would say just to, just to cover your own butt if that thing is a is a day out of date, you do what you have to do within your scope of training to provide care for that patient. <clears throat> and then, uh, so kind of going along with that too, you see here a durable power of attorney for healthcare, and that may give the family member that that uh, authority to say no. I don't, you know, I don't want you to treat him. I don't want, you know, anything to happen. So, uh, you know, that may be where a, a person has been in some type of vegetable type state, um, vegetative state where, you know, but the wife are, is transporting him from some type of hospice doctor visit or something like that. They get in a wreck on the interstate. Okay. You respond to the wreck on the interstate and they're, you know, he's there, he's, he's non-communicative, you know, he can't, you know, he's, uh, he's implied consent basically. And then she provides you with this durable power of attorney and says, I make all decisions on his behalf for, for any medical reasons. And so from there we can, you know, she says, Hey, don't treat him for anything, you know, um, then, then that's it. You know, it's just like if we were talking to him. So that's essentially what that means. Uh, a do not resuscitate order is essentially what we were just talking about with, uh, as far as the resuscitation part of it. Uh, you know, that is, again, pretty specific short term uh, type of order uh, that will give you or that that gives them the right not to be resuscitated. So if you're not able to determine if an advanced directive is legally valid, begin appropriate medical care. And that's what we we're just talking about, right? So um, it says there are some states have systems in place such as bracelets to identify patients with advanced directives. Depends on where you're at. We, you know, we've gone to nursing homes plenty of times, you know, go to hospitals sometimes uh, for, uh, 
for patients that are, you know, terminally ill and they may be in the process of, you know, they're working on the paperwork, you know, all those, all those things are, are, you know, not valid. Okay. It has to be in hand and available for the responder uh, to be able to validate it. So just like um, on the flip side of kidnapping is abandonment. Okay. So abandonment occurs when a trained person begins emergency care and then leaves the patient before another trained person takes over. <clears throat> now, are we talking about, uh, you know, leaving the patient going, running over to the ambulance? No. All right. We're, we're talking about, uh, you know, once you started treatment and you essentially have to leave the scene other than if it is something for personal security, you know, type, personal safety type um, instances, right? So if we have to take that, if we're all of a sudden taking gunfire or there's a huge explosion or something, you know, like we mentioned the other night, it'd be great if you can try to drag your patient to safety also. But if uh, if not, then you need to go and seek shelter somewhere or seek safety somewhere, and that may be in your ambulance down the road, okay? Uh, however, you know, you want to do everything within your ability to ensure that you're continuing some type of uh, care for that patient. And, and by that, I mean letting your dispatch know, hey, we have to get out of here. We're, we're going to get injured if we don't leave. Uh, you know, we're going to get killed if we don't leave. And, um, you know, providing some type of information back and forth, trying to, you know, get back to the patient as soon as possible. All those things show that you are still trying to provide some, some type of care um, and you're not just leaving and not coming back. Okay. <clears throat> so again, one of those things where if you're on the side of the road, you're the only one there and you stopped and helped somebody and then you're like, man, I really need to be at dinner with my girlfriend and, 30 minutes. I, I got to get out of here. You know, I, I know the fire department, and the EMS, they'll be here in just a minute. And uh, there's some bystander here, you know, he's a, you know, he works at the lumber yard and he's just hanging out. And so he'll hang out with them and it'll be fine. Now, once you start, if you start care, okay, you have to continue that. So we've run into this with doctors over the years. It's like at football, um, football games and stuff where we had doctors and, and PAs and everything else come out of the stands, come off the sideline who weren't team physicians and try to provide some type of advanced care or directives. I mean, some advanced um, information towards the paramedic and stuff like that. And when we asked them, okay, well, you're going to continue your level of care. You're going to ride with us and, and continue your level, your level of care, right? And they go, oh, no, I'm, I'm just a spectator, you know, whatever. Okay. Well, then you need to spectate your butt back on up in the stands and stay there because if not, it's going to be – he's going to be abandoning that patient, right? So if he if he starts some type of advanced care uh, on that patient, he has to stay with that patient. So because the paramedic can't may not necessarily be able to take over that level of care, if that makes sense. So the – so once you, again, like it says, once you start a treatment, you must continue it until a person who has um, at least as much training arrives and takes over. So if one of you are on scene, I show up and you're like, oh, geez, Justin, listen, I got dinner with the girlfriend in 30 minutes, man. I'm glad you're here. You, you know, I got a jet. Are you going to be good? You know, this, this is a little pass down for you. This is what's going on with the patient, but I have got to leave. You know, I go, yeah, man, no, sure. No problem. You know, I have, an, I have a higher level of training so I can take over and. Now that patient is under me, and then when a paramedic gets there, he takes it from me, and so on and so forth, right? People dead at the scene. So if you see any signs that a person is alive, you should begin providing care. You know, if we have um, – there are – you know, it's pretty, pretty simple, you know, type – way of looking at it. You don't have to get too, too uh, deep into it. And as you can see here, you know, we can pretty much assume that a person is dead 
uh, unless they have or is alive unless they have decapitation, rigor mortis, which is, you know, when somebody's been dead for a while and they're very stiff, you can barely bend their arms and legs, tissue decomposition, decomposition. Okay, so their skin is coming off. Basically, there's chunks of them missing, uh, like somebody who might be floating in a river for a while. And dependent lividity. Dependent lividity, you can look at it in your book or you can Google it real quick, uh, is when the blood pools at the base layer of whatever side that that person is laying on. So if they were laying on their back, there'd be a, almost a line of blood inside the body that is almost the length of their body, especially on those um, larger parts like the, you know, the back and the back of the legs, things like that. And you'll see that they're white up top and then have that kind of bluish, darkish bruise look uh, to the bottom. And if you roll them over, you'll probably be much more dark on the actual back side of it. That's dependent lividity. Okay. That's when all the blood is draining down because there's no more gravity there. Okay. There's no more, more, no more movement of the blood. So those are the big things that we can reasonably assume someone is deceased. Okay. So if any of the signs of death are present, consider the patient to be dead. But it's important that you know that the protocol is just kind of dependent on some, some certain things. So if you, if you're not sure about it, you know, I'd, I'd let, uh, again, somebody with a higher level of care kind of make that determination unless it's one of those that is absolutely, you know, again, decapitation, you know, that sort of thing. You know, we've had that, we had that in some wrecks and things like that where f uh, members of the fire department and law enforcement were on scene and there's a lot of patients and a lot of bad injuries and also the sort of stuff. And, you know, they may have looked into the car and seen some people that were se severely, severely or mortally, excuse me, wounded. And they, they just were like at, in shock of those wounds. And they said, you know, that person's dead. So the one that's underneath them must be dead too, right? So we kind of start lumping those people in together. Unfortunately, we can't do that, okay? We have to do what's called triage, and we'll get into triage later in trauma, but there are, you know, at some point we have to systematically, you know, put our hands on each patient and really make sure whether they're they're dead or they're viable or, you know, again, it, it may be one of those things where it was, you know, it just happened and, you know, there, it may be, it may be uh, some type of traumatic cardiac arrest where, you know, they just need to be shocked and, you know, they might, might have a fighting chance, right? Especially in younger patients. So uh, it may not be, uh, you know, an actual medical problem per se. I mean, it's not a, uh, it's not an internal problem. It was just something that, uh, that hit them so hard that they needed and it stopped their heart. So they just need to, you know, restart hit the hit the restart button and uh, and then you might have a fighting chance so you know you never you never can tell what what those issues are until you really do a good physical assessment and triage uh, all your patients okay uh, so if there's you know people on top of people and dead people on top of people and all this other stuff those people are going to have to get moved and we don't wait for the coroner to do that um you know, as law enforcement, we can take pictures and all that sort of sort of stuff. And even as first responders, I mean, you could take pictures of that. Not saying you have to keep them, or whatever. But that's that's a that's a record uh, of where that patient was laying. You know, before you moved them. So, you know, if you had somebody take a picture of it real quick, hold it. And, you know, you're not we're not sit, putting it on Facebook, all right? We're holding it for evidentiary purposes for the coroner for law enforcement to be able to see that so that we can tell them hey we had to move this patient uh again through our documentation we'll tell them hey we had to move this patient in order to get to another patient and we had to confirm you know absolutely whether or not they were um they were viable or not so um there's nothing wrong with doing that that's all that's all part of you know patient assessment uh 
and we have to again make sure that that's what we're we're doing that correctly <clears throat> excuse me so uh, going into negligence negligence uh, occurs when a patient sustains further injury or harm because the care administered did not meet standards okay so these conditions must be present again you have a duty to act you had a duty to act and maybe you didn't act breach of duty okay so you you were uh you were carrying out that duty but you uh didn't do it to your to its fullest ability okay you held back with something you didn't do something right resulting injuries so again whatever you did caused further injury <clears throat> and then proximate cause so some of the things that are surrounding that uh some some of the things that are surrounding that what you did all right some of the things systemically the things that are on the outside uh were also uh causes of that or help to cause further injury okay <clears throat> so that negligence is one of those things where it just depends on your level of care. You know, I've seen I've seen paramedics who thought somebody was faking a seizure and literally took a needle, an IV needle, uncapped it and started stabbing them, not I mean stabbing is a harsh word, but poking them with that needle in the bottom of the foot to a teenage kid who was unconscious. To the point to where the bottom of his feet bled. Okay. I mean, I'm not a paramedic, but I can tell you right now, that's not right. Okay. And, you know, those are the types of things that just because you're a first responder, just because you're an EMT, doesn't mean that you can't, you know, you can't uh, notice those things and go, hey, I don't think that's right. Okay. Now, again, depends on the, depends on the patient status and you know what if what they did was you know gonna again it caused them more harm but is it gonna you know seriously cause them to have an adverse reaction or die or you know it's get really bad really fast then we probably want to step in right then and say something you know if it's something that's somewhat uh minimal then we may we may have to wait till afterwards and pull them off to the side before they leave and bring them off to the side of the ambulance and go, Hey man, what in the world was that? And, uh, I don't think that's right. And, you know, me, you and the supervisor are going to have a talk, you know, and they may go, Hey, you know, I did this because of this, I give you some story or whatever. That's fine. You know, if you don't want to do that confrontation like that, then by all means, you need to tell your chain of command, you need to write something up. Okay. And you need to, you need to push it on up. And I've done that multiple times. I have done that multiple times. And uh, I have no qualms about doing that. There's, it's not a, oh, you ratted me out and this and that. No, not, not here. Okay, we don't, we don't, we don't follow, we don't play like that here. All right. When it comes to people's lives and 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 their care that they receive, um, we don't, we don't. Oh, just, just cover for me because you know it's, it's okay. No, if you're gonna, if you're gonna harm somebody more than what they already are. Uh, just because you think that they're faking and that you're aggravated or you had a bad day or, you know, you got some bad news and, and you're mad at the world or whatever, then you need to go home. OK, it's just not the place uh, for, for people like that. So confidentiality, uh, most patient information is confidential, uh, patient history, assessment findings, treatment provided, uh, your communication with the patient, all these things are, are uh, you know, confidential. So uh, you, you probably heard that about doctors over the years and therapists and all sorts of stuff. And that applies to us as well. Uh, the information should be shared only with other medical personnel who are directly involved in the patient's care. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in certain situations, you may release confidential information to designated individuals. You know, if it's a you know, the law enforcement officer who's working the accident may need to have some information, uh, some of the information about their status so that they know whether or not they need to go to the hospital and or whether or not they need to do death notification or, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. 
the the big one that you hear about a lot and it's something that you need to know the at least the base understand have a base understanding of is health insurance portability and accountability act of 1996 or hipaa so hipaa's thrown around all the time you know when people start talking about calls and start talking about um, you know this patient or that patient and there's a lot of little loopholes there for us to be able to you know discuss discuss things but not uh, damage the patient's um, you know rights or, or in, intervene on the patient's rights so it, it essentially strengthens laws for the protection of the privacy of health care information and safeguards patient confidentiality and Again, if you read into it, you read into it more in your book, but it has, it really does have some far reaching effects and it doesn't take much to do it. If you happen to, if you just so happen to, um, you know, get involved in something like that with the, with the wrong person and they want to pursue it, you know, it can be pretty detrimental and doesn't, it, like I said, it doesn't take a whole lot to, uh, to get you mixed up in, in something like that. So before you start uh, getting on getting on text message after the call or going on Snapchat or you know whatever talking about the, this bad call you just went to whatever, really think about who you're talking to. Uh, make sure you understand the information that you can and can't divulge about that patient, and uh, and definitely with pictures and things of that nature. Obviously, we you know taking pictures used to be really taboo. Um, you know. Every cop has a body camera on. We take pictures of stuff all the time. And, you know, like I said, most of the time it's for uh, it's for our documentation purposes, for our reports. Um, but there's nothing saying that, you know, medical providers and this and, and firefighters and things like that can't take pictures at some of these scenes. Uh, but you have to also be very cognizant about what you can and can take pictures of and how you can um, how you can proceed with those pictures. You know, so there are plenty of times where you're going to have to doctor the picture and so you can't see their face or, you know, something like that or any other type of uh, identifying marks or anything like that. Right. So there's, there's lots, several different ways that you have to look at it depending on the call and depending on the patient. So the good Samaritan laws uh, protect citizens from liability for errors or omissions in giving good faith emergency care. All right, this is where uh, a lot of the CPR, AED type uh, coverage comes from the Good Samaritan laws. Again, they don't cover everything. They don't they they don't apply to every single thing that we do or how we do it, and they do kind of vary from state to state. There's they're pretty standardized, but uh, they may have little bits and pieces different of difference, and. As you can see there, it says provide little or no legal protection for an EMS provider. Okay, it really is for that good Samaritan layperson, you know, non-trained uh, somebody out there who's just trying to do good uh, to so that they don't get sued and and um, you know ran over by the legal train um, just because they were again in good faith trying to do a prudent. A reasonable person would do in their position okay so we talked a little bit about regulations before again become familiar with those that are in your agency and in your state they um, you know it's just good stuff to know it just makes you a better provider a uh, medical provider and you know you can go way down the rabbit hole with a lot of that stuff but it's good to have a, a basic knowledge of especially your state and your local uh, regulations about what you can and can't do and um, you know, things such as that. Certification and registration may be required, again, to work as an EMR. We mentioned that before. Uh, and you're responsible for keeping those certifications and registrations current. So if you do happen to get a uh, national registry or you have uh, work in a state that requires you to be state uh, certified, you have to keep that up depending on what it is. So for national registry, it's usually every two years. You have to keep uh, keep all your skills up. You have to do um, you have to, you know, you have to do a few things for first responders, really not a whole lot. And it's actually gotten way easier over the years for EMT and paramedic as well. So, um, you know, just to kind of, they streamlined a lot of stuff and made it a lot more user friendly to be able to get your stuff completed. 
So reportable events. So if you are on the scene of something and you're like, man, I, you know, do if if I either whether or not we're transporting, but you know, if we transport them, do we uh, do we get you know, do we need to tell somebody about? you know, this or that, or if, even if, especially if we're going to be on scene and they're going to, you know, maybe refuse transport and we treated them for something, but you know, this, this kind of, there's something more here, you know, something happened, something else happened here. We get privy to, to some information uh, while law enforcement's talking to them or, you know, while, uh, while we're doing, you know, a patient history and we're talking to them about what happened and how, how this injury happened and, you know, that uh, it brings about something about domestic violence or rape or, you know, something like that, especially, you know, we want to, we want to make sure that we report those things, but, you know, knife wounds, gunshot wounds, motor vehicle collisions, suspected child or elder abuse, domestic violence, dog bites, rape. Uh, these are all, you know, th this is not all inclusive. However, if it just, if it seems fishy to you, especially when it seems fishy to you and they don't want to get evaluated and you, you absolutely are absolutely against being uh, evaluated, especially at the hospital or don't, don't want you there. Don't want law enforcement there, that sort of thing. You know, if you can at least get their, you know, get some patient information like their name and address, phone number, that sort of stuff. And, uh, and you need to report that up, you know, your training command and then maybe the law enforcement or something like that so that they can follow up on it and make sure that there's nothing, you know, really bad going on there. And, you know, some, some agencies, some local areas may have different ones. So just like a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, make sure that you are, you know, up on your local processes as well. So if you fail to notify somebody and something bad happens to something to someone, and then all of a sudden, you know, that gets back that, Oh, well, you know, so-and-so, the EMR was there, um, you know, five minutes before that, and they talked to them, and they saw all the injuries and stuff, and they just let them go. Or they, they didn't say nothing about it, right? And they go back, and they look in the dispatch records. They go back and look in your reports, and they go, yep, sure, sure enough. They didn't, they didn't say anything about it in their report. They didn't call anybody. They didn't, you know, they didn't make anybody aware of it, you know? So now what, what are you at that point? you're negligent okay so at that point you're negligent and uh because you didn't uh you didn't follow through with you know prescribed processes and, and that sort of thing okay so again anytime you're dealing with stuff like this err on the side of caution you know cover your butt and make sure that you are uh doing the right thing for the patient all right crime scene operations the you know these can be pretty chaotic you know usually there's a bunch of stuff going on um a lot of times if the unless it's just a really like like there's multiple patients and especially in this area if there unless there's multiple patients or the patient is really bad bad off then a lot of times they you know they don't really call for the fire departments so they don't call for emrs um to come and assist just because we don't want all of those people in that spot at one time and it's nothing against anybody it's not it's not saying that you're, you're not capable of being in there and, and operating appropriately um, however history tells us that the more people we have in there uh, the worse the evidence becomes okay and that's really what we're trying to do is protect the evidence protect protect the scene and and ensure that you know we can you know, bring justice to whoever caused this because a lot of times we don't know. So we want to make sure that we have every piece of physical evidence that we can possibly get uh, from the patient, you know, which could be a victim, could be the aggressor, could be, you know, a lot of different cases there. But we can also uh, ensure that we are uh, getting all the actual physical evidence from from the scene, you know, blood, body fluids, hair, um, you know, all sorts of different things. And so these are all things you need to be considering uh, when you are, the, if you are there uh, to make sure that you are protecting yourself, um, you know, that you are, again, trying to treat the patient, right? But we're not just throwing chairs out of the way. We're not just like kicking shell casings all over the place, you know, 
um, you know, we, we, there's taking the knife out of their hand and just grabbing it with our bare hands and tossing it out of the way and all this other stuff, right? So hopefully law enforcement should be there and kind of secure any of those types of weapons and stuff. Uh, however, you rolled up on it, law enforcement's not there yet. You know, all these things are, you need to be considering that, hey, this is going to be a potential crime scene real fast. And you may be still in it, okay? Um, you know, that's the other part of that, okay? Talking about going to court. You, you know, when you intervene in something like that or you're in that before law enforcement gets there or even when you do respond there, especially once we have set up some type of actual crime scene, um, you're going to be documented as being there. And it's going to be documented that you were there, you provided care or you were assisting with care, whatever the case may be. And, uh, and you may be called upon to testify as to your part in that, okay, or somebody else's part in that what did you hear see smell feel touch that sort of thing so when you're assessing the scene document anything that seems unusual uh like i said especially if you're there before law enforcement which most cases uh it's make it we make it pretty clear that you need to stay out of there until we get there and and make sure the scene is safe uh before you can come in and then what we try to kind of navigate you to the location where we want you to be, uh, the patients that we, we need you to go to. Um, and that way you're not, you're not disturbing any other areas that we're, that we're currently working on. Uh, move the patient only if necessary, not necessarily a bad idea. If the patient, if it's uh, if it's doable, you got the people to try to take that patient, lift them up, put them on the backboard, something, and just get them up and out of there and move them to an area that's not necessarily, um, uh, you know, been, been exposed to all the, all the stuff going on. And it might make it a little bit, it, it's better for us a lot of times. And so a lot of times that it's also easier for, for EMS to access them to, you know, to do everything they need to do. And it just be a little bit easier that way. <coughs> Excuse me. Touch only what you need to touch to gain access to the patient. Like I said before, you know, we're not just grabbing stuff, throwing stuff around, just be doing it. Uh, really, you know, watch where you set your bags down. Watch where you step. Watch where you put the backboard. Watch where you, you know, uh, put your equipment at. You know, all these things, for one, can be contaminated with blood and body fluids, things of that nature. However, um, you may be setting it right down on top of, you know, a key piece of evidence. Okay. So just be cautious about where you're setting stuff down at. So again, try to preserve that crime scene for investigation and do not cut through knife or bullet holes in the patient's clothing. We're, you know, in trauma cases, we're going to get them trauma naked. We're going to cut them. We're going to cut their clothes off or pull their clothes off, however we need to do it. Um, but if you, if it is a potential knife or bullet holes or explosion or something of that nature, just try, you know, if, especially if the blast was from the front, stab wounds were from the front, things like that. You roll them over. They don't have any exit wounds. Cut the back of the shirt and just take the shirt off uh, from back to front. You know, little things like that, you know, again, would, again, would just help to preserve any evidence that they may be, uh, that they may need to assess later in the, in the crime lab. And it lets somebody know. Right. Let somebody let, let one of the law enforcement officers know, hey, we just cut this shirt off of this patient, you know, John Smith, and this is his shirt. OK. And that way they know, OK, this is John Smith's shirt. We're going to tag it, put it in a bag, that sort of stuff. So, again, like we said before, be careful where you place equipment, keep non-essential people away, uh, work with the appropriate law enforcement authorities on the scene and write a short report about the incident. You know, again, another one of those cover your butt things. Uh, just good documentation. Just tell us, you know, who you are, where you went, what you did, and who was there with you, right? And that way, uh, that covers your butt. Make sure that you, um, you know, are truthful and honest about, you know, what you saw, what you did, what you, why you were there, you know, and what what placed you there, that sort of thing. So going into documentation, uh, you know, your documentation is the initial account describing the patient's condition and the care administered. So you can get, especially at the advanced care level, you can get way deep in the weeds in this. Uh, you know, you can get re really, uh, like I said, deep in the weeds with terminology and, and wording and 
uh, you know, steps that you took and all this other stuff to provide care. Um, but really, you know, try to keep it simple, especially at the EMR level. Uh, it, it really is, um, you know, who, what, when, where, and why, and making sure that we are, you know, just document what we did, where we did it at, who we did it on, you know, that sort of stuff. Okay. And again, like I said, it serves as a legal record for your treatment. It's, it lets us, let's the attorney know, let's a doctor know, let's family members know, you know, what type of treatment was initiated. And like we said at the beginning of this, your treatment, your treatment as an EMR sets the tone for everything else. Okay. So if they're receiving really good, high quality patient care at the beginning. Well, hopefully we're going to push that on along all the way up until they get into the hospital and then end, end up going home. Right. Hopefully. So again, it provides a basis for evaluating the quality of care provided. So you can always go back and review those reports and say, oh, you know what? We did this for that patient, but you know, we really could have done this or that or something better, you know, two years later, Hey, we could have done something better uh, that we didn't have access to then. Right. Like I mentioned a second ago, it really needs to be clear, concise, accurate, and readable. Okay. Uh, you know, take your time, read through it several times, have somebody else read through it and, and make sure that it is, uh, it, it's what you want to say. Uh, don't try to be a doctor when you're reading, writing it. Okay. Don't try to make it sound fancy. Uh, you're just gonna, you're just gonna make it worse. Okay. Uh, it's, it's also not common language. Like we're not talking to our buddy typing this report. Okay. Uh, so it just needs to be clear and concise, which means that it's, it is uh, to the point, so we're not going all the way around the world to say that we, you know, arrived on scene, found this patient, you know, Miss Smith, uh, to be lying face down in a puddle of blood, and, you know, my partner, John Smith, and I, you know, decided uh, or chose to move this patient from this location to this location uh, due to inherent danger of down power lines, you know, or something like that. Right. So anything in there that's notable, that's, uh, that gives you, that gives you a reason why you did something. We want to put that reasoning in there. Okay. So condition of the patient when found patient's description of the illness or injury. Uh, you know, I noted, uh, when I, I, uh, miss, you know, Jane Smith, I rolled her over, uh, to find Miss Smith had, you know, two what to appear to be gunshot wounds to the upper left chest uh, with minimal bleeding. Okay. You know, initial and repeated vital signs. Those are, you know, anything that when we start talking about vital signs later on, it's going to be the things that we're trying to get uh, blood pressure, pulse, heart rate, breathing rate, all these different types of things uh that are going to help kind of walk us down the path of what where our patient is in their viability okay so if we can do that and we can do that you know in a consistent manner our report is going to you know reflect kind of like a, a sequence okay so the tra treatment you gave the patient and agency and personnel who took over treatment of the patient so again we took over patient care when we got there or we took it over from someone else bystanders you know um you know so and so was on scene i arrived i took over care i took over patient care and then so on and so forth and then emt justin miller arrived on scene took over patient care from me and so on and so forth down the line right and uh, any reportable conditions present. So we mentioned that about power lines or any other type of safety issues or, uh, you know, anything else that is notable for the patient's condition. Okay. Any infectious disease uh, exposure. So right now it would be big if, if for some reason you, you came into contact with a COVID patient uh, that, you know, whether it was COVID symptoms or whatever, it doesn't really matter. If you, if you had that knowledge that uh, this patient was potentially, you know, or specifically 
um, diagnosed with COVID, then you want to put that in your report, right? Now, later on, if for some reason, regardless of what it is, a bloodborne pathogen or anything like that, you get sick, you know, two years from now, and it's directly related to that. Well, we can go back and show, hey, I was working. I was at work when this happened. I, you know, uh, I was in an official capacity as a volunteer firefighter or as a police officer, you know, whatever. And this is, I was exposed to this at, you know, at that time. Uh, I took all my necessary precautions, had all my PPE on. However, you know, this, uh, I, you know, I was exposed at some point. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, needle sticks, you know, any of that sort of stuff, the same thing. So if we get, you know, if we get exposed to anything like that, we want to make sure that we are um, divulging that. So again, could be an insurance issue, could be, you know, a, a medical legal issue down the down the road for you or your agency, uh, or for that patient. So anything unusual regarding the situation? Just anything that's out of the norm that that you think is noteworthy that could be a potential cause for the injury or illness, or that could be, you know, noteworthy to law enforcement or to the physician or to the family, something like that. All right. Any questions on anything we covered so far, medical legal? Nothing. All right. Let's take uh, let's take ten minutes. We'll come back and we're going to get into body systems, chapter six.
Hey, Rob, you in there? All right, everybody, we're back. We'll uh, get started here. Chapter six, the human body. We got uh, kind of kind of an overview. Uh, we're going to get more into body systems and specific, you know, injury types and illnesses and things like that. But uh, for now, this is just kind of your introduction to to the body and its parts. Okay, the a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in this class as we go forward is is uh is going to be based on some of these very simple things that we talk about tonight just understanding and communicating in a unified organized manner to another provider uh and also your documentation that we just talked about is going to be key for you to understand these things so as you're going through your book and you see you know, pictures and things like that, you know, really pay attention to what we're talking about here when we, when we mention those different types of body parts and location of injuries, that sort of thing. So starting off here with some, uh, with some anatomy, the, if you look, let me see if I can help you out here. All right, so if you if you look here, you can see the um, the where it says midline. Okay, you can see that yellow arrow, the yellow arrow. That yellow arrow is essentially if you if you ran that yellow line all the way down, all right, all the way down the midline, right straight to the center of the chest, right straight through the navel, the groin, and then all the way down to the floor. All right, that's that's our midline. That's our starting point for left and right. Okay, if you if you understand what anatom the anatomical position is 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 essentially as you as you stand there. Okay, your left and right. So whenever we're talking about a patient, we're talking about that patient's left and right. Okay, so not your left and right, the patient's left and right, or uh, away for, or their midline. OK, so if it's left or right of the midline, you know, and then we're going to go, um, you know, proximal and distal, which is, you know, farther away from the midline OK, or closer to the midline. So my hand is distal from my midline. OK, uh, my elbow, OK, is proximal to my hand. All right. So, of course, we have anterior, posterior, front and back. OK, so anterior being the front, posterior being the back. And then we have uh, superior and inferior, which is uh, is kind of the same thing as the midline, but more of the north and south. It's the up and down. OK, so nearest the head and farthest from the head. So, um, you know, our knee would be inferior from our foot. Okay, or superior to our foot. All right, our foot would be inferior from our knee. Makes sense? So that, and then like I said, medial and lateral is, you know, anything is lateral would be more on the outside of the midline, and then medial would be inside the midline. So you think about your big toe is medial, your little toe is lateral. Okay. And if you looked at, say, your arm, okay, so the inside of your arm would be medial and the outside of your arm would be lateral, okay? So that's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that's kind of how we refer to a lot of things. So going forward, we're going to try to use a lot of this terminology when we, when we mention about, you know, locations of injuries and, and body system issues and things like that. We're going to talk in these terms, okay? So it behoove you 
to really go back and look at some of these pictures that we're going to look at tonight and the things in your book and make sure that you understand what it's talking about. Uh, easiest, the best way is just to utilize it in your day-to-day -day life. You know, try to try to think and talk in those in those terms. You know, in your head uh, when you're looking at those types of things, and that way you can you know have a better idea of what those mean. One second. So topographic anatomy, the standard anatomical position, like I said before, is, you know, the, uh, the position in which that, that gentleman was just standing there. And it ultimately is, is uh, of the patient's orientation, right? Not your orientation. So standing there facing you with arms, and si arms at the side and thumbs pointing outward is the anatomical position, okay? Anterior is the front surface of the body, posterior is the back, midline refers to that imaginary line right through the body, okay, straight down. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so again, we, we just covered these, and uh, again, we'll just we'll use them as often as we can, and, and for those of you who are, you know, reading through your book later, you can, you can again, go back over those. So going into the respiratory system, like I said, we're just hitting some of these right now. This is not the full respiratory, um, you know, chapter. This is just, you know, again, an overview uh, of all the different things that kind of make up the body. So the respiratory system consists of all structures of the body that contribute to normal breathing. Okay. It brings oxygen into the body and removes waste gas and CO2 uh, as it goes out of carbon dioxide. So we have the upper airway, all right, the, uh, the lower upper and lower airway, basically the uh, trachea is just a simply our windpipe, right? That's what uh, goes down into our lungs. Uh, the other tube there would be the esophagus that goes into the stomach. Uh, as we go down, we go to, to the carina. The carina is that main branch, okay, where the left and right lung branch off from. Uh, uh, then we have the uh, main bronchus, which is that main tube going down before uh, off the carina that goes into our bronchioles and then the actual, you know, into the, the where the gas exchange occurs in the lung. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the diaphragm that helps to move our, you know, move that air uh, up and down and, and keeps our upper and lower torso separated uh, from our digestive system and all that stuff. So that airway consists of our nasopharynx, which is our nose, our oropharynx, which is our mouth, throat, larynx, which is our voice box, trachea, our windpipe, and then our, and passages within the lungs like we were just we were just looking at. So you break that down even farther. We have you know the nasal cavity. So when you take a breath in through your nose or your mouth, okay. It's going to go in the oral pharynx or the nasal pharynx. It's going to come down. Uh, the epiglottis is going to keep things out of our airway and route those solid pieces of food and water or liquid down into our esophagus and not into our trachea. Okay, so the epiglottis is a little flap there that keeps that stuff from going into our lungs. Okay. Uh, we refer to that as aspirating when we do that. So if we do happen to have things that go in there, it may be aspirated. So again, going down there is the larynx and then the esophagus uh, in front of that. Trachea is windpipes back behind it and then, or in, sorry, in front of it. And then the uh, then it goes down to the lungs. So uh, several different things to consider here and when we get, when we talk about um, you know, airway management and things of that nature. We'll talk specifically about some of these areas. So the oxygen CO2 exchange um, typically happens at the alveolar level. Uh, and what happens is that if you notice the red over here on the right hand picture, you'll notice the red, um, you know, the red is the artery and blue is the vein. And so essentially that 
those those vessels are wrapped around those and, and intertwined with those uh, alveolar sacs, those little tiny sacs. And what happens is that uh, that air exchanges there. And whenever we take that big deep breath in and bring in that oxygen, it'll it brings it in and can, puts it into the bloodstream right there. OK, um, and then it takes it out through this takes that CO2 and exhales it out. OK, so it exchanges that air at a microscopic level. And then we have good air in, bad air out. And that's how that that's a, that's the very uh, small scale of that air exchange. OK, so it, it is exactly that we exchange good air for bad air and it travels through our bloodstream through those vessels that are intertwined in those um, in those uh, alveolar sacs. OK. So air is inhaled when the diaphragm, and the chest muscles contract. OK, so when they come up and you take a big, deep breath, right? You feel your chest kind of rise, you feel your diaphragm kind of rise a little bit, and your chest tightens up. And then air is exhaled when these muscles relax. <clears throat> Excuse me. So moving on to the circulatory system, the, you know, again, a lot of these things are like we just saw there where the circulatory system and the respiratory system are connected, right? So that's that's the way it is with a lot of things in our body so that everything works harmoniously. If it didn't, we, we you know, we'd have individual little systems doing their own thing and nothing would be balanced. But it, it includes the heart, blood, and blood vessels. So the flow of blood uh, picks up oxygen in the lungs and goes uh, to the heart. So, you know, again, it's a system. So we kind of start somewhere. So kind of this kind of makes a little bit more sense to start here as to where the flow of blood goes. Uh, but again, just remember, it, it goes systemically all over the body, it goes all through the body and comes back. Uh, so, again, it picks up the oxygen in the lungs like we just talked about and goes to the heart. OK, so it picks up that oxygen rich blood. The heart pumps it to the rest of the body. Okay, so it goes to the heart, the heart pumps, you know, takes all that nice oxygen rich blood, pumps it out to the rest of the body where it can be used by your cells. The cells absorb oxygen and nutrients from the blood and release waste products. The blood carries the waste back to the lungs and kidneys. Okay, in the lungs, the blood exchanges the carbon dioxide for more oxygen. All right, and the kidneys obviously gets rid of your uh, liquid waste and all that sort of stuff, right? All the, all the other toxins, some of the other toxins and things that we have, uh, our kidney and liver, you know, will help to uh, filtrate and expel, okay? So the heart consists of four chambers. Uh, each upper chamber is, is called the atrium, and each lower chamber is called the ventricle. The, uh, the chambers work together to pump the blood uh, to the lungs and to the rest of the body. Um, it, it's essentially, and as you can see here in this picture, you know, it's, it's a decent one. There's a tons of different graphics out there. Uh, if you're looking out there online, there's, there's tons of great YouTube videos on blood flow and, and cardiac output and how, how the heart works, that sort of thing. Uh, that really kind of gives you a, a much better detail of this. Uh, but again, as you can see, we have that red and blue. Okay. Which is in a lot of, you know, medical, you know, uh, type, uh, you know, some of the graphics that you see and dealing with the medical, medical science and that sort of thing, you're going to get, uh, the, this red and blue contrast so that it kind of separates oxygenated and non-oxygenated blood. Okay. So red being oxygenated, being more venous, I mean, uh, uh, arterial blood and blue being the venous or vein blood uh, that is non-oxygenated in most cases. So, so what you have there again, like I said, like you see here uh, is the uh, atriums at the top and ventricles at the bottom left and right. Okay. And as you can see, you kind of follow the arrows there that where it says up the top, the blood comes from the body. Okay. Into the vena cava. All right. Comes down 
dumps into dumps in there and then it will start to go to the right atrium down the right ventricle okay then back out all right to the lungs to get oxygenated now once it gets oxygenated it's going to come back all right as oxygenated and it will um go into the left ventricle i'm sorry left atrium left ventricle and then from the pulmonary veins and that will move it uh, the rest of the way and up and out, as you can see, uh, where it says blood to all parts of the body. So it'll go out that aorta and out to the rest of the body. Uh, that's why we talk about, you know, if somebody has a large vein, large, I mean, a large vein or vessel uh, that is um, severed or, you know, impacted by that. Or if there's a blockage or something of some of these, it's it's very detrimental to your patient, right? It's it's almost certain death uh, when some of those things are impacted because it's moving because the majority of your blood is coming through those vessels, right? Again, we're going to get more into these when we get into cardiac, but it, uh, it just to kind of give you an idea how that blood flows through the heart. Uh, again, the arteries carry blood away from the heart at high pressure and therefore have thick walls. All right, so. <clears throat> whenever we have, you know, sometimes we have issues with people who just over the, over time, those walls start to deteriorate and that, that will cause issues. Sometimes we'll have buildup on those walls, um, you know, from eating too many cheeseburgers and that sort of thing. And, um, and so we end up having, um, you know, we, are, we end up systemically having issues from that where we have blockages and arteriosclerosis, you know, hardening of the arteries and all sorts of stuff. So, <clears throat> So there are three major arteries, uh, carotid, the femoral, and the radial, uh, and these are also points where we check for pulses. Okay, so going forward, when we check for pulses, we're typically going to check them in the neck at the carotid artery, all right, the groin at the femoral artery, and the wrist and the radial artery. Uh, this kind of gives us locations where we can kind of see, um, you know, how far, how much pressure is getting out there, right? So if we, and there are other ones, um, out there, popliteal artery behind the knee, the dorsal, you know, uh, pulse point there on the top of the foot. But, uh, and, it, and that, those things just kind of help us get an idea of how much pressure uh, the heart is outputting uh, based off of how far that blood is flowing enough to create that pulse. So, uh, but that's just a, a little gee whiz for you. But that, um, those three major arteries are the carotid artery, the femoral artery, and the radial artery. So as you can see there, so we're talking about uh, those of you who've been in the bleeding control classes that I've done. You know, we talk we talk a lot about you know bleeding out and, and bleeding in locations where uh, people can bleed. And so you know, really, when we see bleeding coming from areas like this, we really get concerned, and we want to make sure that uh, that we control that bleeding quickly. So we'll get into that more as well. But that's just you know something to think about. So the capillaries are the smallest vessels, uh, veins are the thin walled vessels that carry blood back to the heart. So whenever we like, so when a paramedic starts an IV or something like that, uh, it's that's into a vein and that vein is going to carry that uh, through that system that we just showed you. And it's going to circulate that medicine or whatever that hydration, whatever it might be uh, throughout the body uh, to get it there pretty quick. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have, Arteries, veins, uh, and capillaries. Those capillaries are those really small ones, let's say like in your fingertips that carry blood to your fingertips, that sort of thing. Uh, that's essentially capillaries' job is to get down there in those small areas and, uh, and oxygenate those areas as well. So blood has several components, uh, plasma, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. Uh, each one of these has different uh, responsibilities in the blood. Uh, blood is essentially... Uh, you know, uh, uh, our transportation vessel, like we were just talking about with for just for medicine in general, but nutrients in, as, in a whole as a whole, uh, you know, all the different uh, antibodies, all the different things that we use from white, white and red blood cells to help repair the body uh, are key uh, parts to, you know, making clots to, um, you know, to, again, good cellular health throughout the body. All these types of things are, are you know, carrying nutrients and essential things uh, throughout the body for us. Um, but again, knowing that 
that's even more reason why, you know, when we're doing things, uh, we try to keep things clean. We try to, you know, we try to give the body as much opportunity to do its own thing, which is really, really good at, um, as we can. Okay. So we really don't want to try to mess up what the body's already doing too much, uh, unless it absolutely needs it. Okay. So if it needs it, we're obviously going to try to help it out as best we can, but ultimately, especially at our level, we really want to try to keep, keep the body doing whatever it's trying to do to help compensate itself. So the skeletal system uh, consists of bones and connective tissue that protect and support our framework for our body, right? We, we kind of already know a lot of this stuff, but, you know, again, just kind of going over the, uh, the basics here. So again, support the body, protect vital structures, you know, our rib cage helps provide a lot of support uh, to manufacture red blood cells, which again, go into our bloodstream, helps repair our body, okay? So a lot of different bones out there. We're definitely not going to go all, all over 200 plus bones in the body. Uh, but there are, um, there's some, some key ones here. Obviously we need to be, you know, cognizant of, uh, the skull, you know, there's different parts of the skull as well. Um, uh, the face, there's multiple different bones in the face and the jaw and all that, uh, clavicle scapula. So the cap clavicle is that bone there, your, um, bone that runs from your chest plate over to your shoulder. Um, your scapula would be in the back. It's kind of that, that kind of wing shaped bone in the back there. Sternum obviously is that hard breast bone there in the front, your chest plate. Uh, the thorax is essentially your ribs. Uh, so we have, uh, as you can see there, we have several sets of ribs that are connected, semi-connected. And then we have uh, a few floating ribs down there. Uh, that are again all all those are connected at some point to the uh to the spinal column and come off the spinal column spinal column to give that nice our nice rigid you know frame that we have when we stand up uh however we couldn't stand up if we didn't have the vertebrae and we have we're going to go with the vertebrae here in just a second um we have multiple different ones of those and those you'll need to know the pelvis uh, obviously kind of gives us that um, that foundation for just about everything that we do. It's a foundation for our, um, you know, our spine that sits on there, our hips, I mean, our uh, hip bones, that sort of thing for our femur to sit in, rotate in and take all that, you know, when we're running and jumping and all that stuff. It really does take a lot of that, uh, absorb a lot of that energy. <clears throat> so going back up, the humerus is essentially the upper arm bone from your shoulder to your elbow. The uh, ulna radius is, uh, you know, a lot of people get these confused. And so the ulna radi the ulna is that if you're looking again at the anatomical position with the thumb out, okay, that ulna is going to be the more internal bone or the more medial bone. All right. And the radius is going to be the more um, distal bone. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, a lateral bone. So that is the, uh, those are the two different ones for the arm. Uh, one is a primary bone and one is more of a support bone. However, they, you know, they work great, quite well with each other. But again, that's what allows us to uh, invert our hand back and forth. Okay. Is, is, are those bones that, uh, as they connect to the, uh, to the elbow. And again, it gives us that structure that we need to be able to do, push-ups and hold our hold our weight up and all that sort of stuff the fingers uh doesn't have it on here but essentially uh, for the toes and fingers uh we refer to them as the fingers as uh carpals metacarpals and phalanges so if you look at the at the wrist and work our way down all right it's going to be carpals and then to the next to the next um, uh, uh, joint there is uh, metacarpals, and then the very tips of your fingers are phalanges. Okay, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. And our feet, it's tarsals, metatarsals, phalanges. Okay, so carpals for fingers, tarsals with a T, so T toes for the feet. 
so our going down here on our legs, the uh, femur, obviously our big, our big weight bearing bone. Patella is that little bone that makes up your kneecap. Again, the other one that uh, that most people kind of get confused here is the tib fib or tibia and fibula. So we usually refer to that as tib fib uh, uh, for short. Uh, the tibia is going to be your primary, the one that when you when you reach down there and you feel your your bone in your shin, that's your tibia. Uh, if you go uh, lateral, okay, uh, away from the midline, you'll feel the uh, tibia or I'm sorry, the fibula. So again, that's e either side, both both call the same thing, tibia and fibula. Just be left left or right tibia or fibula. And again, like I said, well, you know like the heel bone is called the calcaneus, right? So there's a lot of bones here, a lot of different types of bones, small bones here and there that make up that there are several more here, 200, like I said, 200 plus bones. Uh, again, the bones and the skull, uh, you know, include the skull and the lower jaw bone or the mandible. Um, so you have the mandible and maxilla. The skull consists of many bones uh, fused together to form a hollow sphere that contains and protects the brain. So if you ever look at like a, you know, a skeleton or even a, a toy skeleton or something like that, there's going to be lines up there on the skull. Uh, and that's essentially what, what that is. It's just those fused plates from when we were a child that f started to fuse together and helped our brain to, to grow and our, and our body to grow, that sort of thing. Uh, so that, that's what allows for that is the, that, that uh, those kind of, plate type uh, bone segments. The jawbone is a movable bone that is attached to the skull and completes the structure of the head. <clears throat> so talking about the spine consists of 33 vertebrae, uh, you know, from, from top to bottom there. The, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on there. This is the neuro pathway that controls a lot of what we do um, in our body. And, and our brain, our brain controls it, but it's really the workhorse uh, from our brain to make make a lot of these things work. It's what obviously protects our so our spinal column, and uh, which is again that neuro pathway through all those different nerves that go all the way down and control everything in our body. Okay, all the all the things that we do. <clears throat> Muscles, tendons, discs, ligaments, all these things help to keep that structure nice and tight. Again, as we sit poorly in our vehicles every day and we sit poorly at our desk every day, um, you know, we, we get hit playing football or we, you know, slip and fall off the porch or whatever, you know, all these different things start to deteriorate, take trauma uh, to them and start to uh, start to give us problems. Right. And uh, we overwork them. We don't stretch. Everything's tight. And, and so there was a lot of different issues with the back and um, and the spine. Uh, as a whole. So the spinal cord passes through that hole in the center of each spinal vertebra and it essentially has five sections. Okay. So the cervical vertebrae is those seven from the base of the skull. Okay. So if you feel up to the back of your back of your neck and you start to feel a couple little notches there. Okay. That's um, that's going to be the start of your cervical vertebrae. <clears throat> that is going to uh, again. There's seven of those. So seven, twelve, five is the is your primary ones. Seven cervical vertebrae, twelve thoracic vertebrae. So remember, we talk about the the thorax being the middle there, being around the center. So if you if you remember that your thoracic vertebrae is around your thorax, then you know that kind of help you remember that order. Okay. Uh, you probably heard of lumbar support. Like maybe a vehicle has lumbar support or a chair has lumbar support. Well, that's what that's for. It's for your lumbar vertebrae. And there's five of those. So seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar. And that, that goes all the way down to your sacral vertebrae, which is more of a fused type uh, bone, uh, bony process at the bottom of your lumbar vertebrae. Uh, once you get down past that, you have the coxial vertebrae and that's the very tip that's your butt bone a lot of people call it your butt bone but it's uh it's the very tip of that bony process uh that helps to give your back and your hips and things like that and your the back of your hips that function i mean that form um 
and again helps you have a nice firm seated position as well um so whenever you rock back and and you you um you don't just roll back over it, it gives you that you know nice sturdy form uh that we're all accustomed to having as we sit down <clears throat> So just kind of going in a few of these other little areas here, the shoulder girdles, uh, each shoulder girdle supports an arm and consists of three bones, the collarbone, shoulder blade, which is the scapula, and your upper arm bone, which is your humerus. So all those things form the, the shoulder girdle and uh, again, keeps you, uh, you take it for granted if you ever hurt your shoulder or, you know, you have any type of called subluxation or, you know, where it kind of partially comes out of place or something of that nature, you're going to know it. It's very painful. Shoulder injuries are very painful, very restrictive. A lot of times we take it for granted what we can and can't do. Um, so, you know, if you have patients who are experiencing some of these things, it's important to understand that the, a lot of these things are very painful. With clavicle injuries, especially we get it, see it in like a lot of kids, sports, things of that nature. <clears throat> Uh, older people who fall often have uh, clavicle injuries. Clavicles hurt just to breathe, okay? Uh, not a whole lot that you can do for them. You kind of just have to take it easy, uh, you know, shallow breathe for a while. And, uh, and in, a, in a few weeks, it, it kind of heals on its own as, as long as it's not just grossly fractured. Uh, but a lot of them are just cracked and, and they tend to, uh, the treatment plan is usually just for them to heal on their own. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's uh, that's one of those things where, you know, you try to be like we mentioned the other night, when you want to try to be empathetic of these patients, because a lot of these injuries are uh, very painful. So the upper extremity, again, the upper arm has one bone called the humerus, that that large upper arm bone. Uh, the forearm has two bones, like we mentioned earlier, the ulnar radius and the wrist and hand consist of several bones. Those carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Uh, we also refer to those fingers as digits, okay? Uh, you know, honestly, I really don't, not quite certain why, but that that is the, uh, you know, a pretty common term for when we talk about fingers in general. So first, second, third, fourth digit, and the thumb. Uh, so if we, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, kind of trying to be descriptive uh, of the of the hand. The rib cage, uh, again, 12 sets of ribs protect the heart, lungs, and liver, and spleen, all those different little things that are up there in our upper quadrants uh, of our body uh, help to uh, help protect that. So as you can see here, you have the sternal notch, which is if you look, if you feel down your throat, and then all of a sudden you start to feel it get hard, all right, that's going to be our sternal notch there. And starting right just below that, just below the clavicle, you're going to have your first set of ribs, uh, and then it works all the way down to those uh, uh, primary 11, and then those 12, or that 12th is the uh, floating ribs there. So the main body of the sternum uh, and your menubrium is going to be that kind of that bigger, wider part of the top, but that body is going to be that flat part coming down in the center of your chest. And then the very tip, is going to be the xiphoid process. So if you want to know how to pronounce that X word, it's xiphoid with like a Z. It sounds like a Z. Okay. So xiphoid process. Uh, this is also our landmark for CPR. So if you find the xiphoid process, go two finger widths above onto the sternum, uh, right onto the body of the sternum around ribs three and four. That's where we're going to place our hands for CPR. Okay. Uh, we use we use these as you go on, especially you know, higher levels uh, of training, you'll get, you know, you have to do, you know, more invasive procedures and we use the ribs as landmarks and we have to do certain invasive procedures uh, based off of locations of ribs and sternum and things of that nature. So it's uh, in the clavicle as well. So it's important to make sure we understand where all these things are and how they play out. So the pelvis uh, serves as a link between the body and the lower extremities. Um, you know, like I said, it really is that that foundation uh, for the body. It's what's our. It's kind of at our center there. What gives us our helps with our center of gravity. Um, another big thing there is that it it 
uh, those big vessels that we mentioned earlier, as you saw, uh, travel through there. So typically when we have pelvic injuries, we're really concerned about uh, internal bleeding. Uh, usually if there are fractures of the pelvis, it's also, again, very painful. There is not a whole lot of ways to make that feel better. Uh, we have a few different ways of pelvic slings and, and a couple different, you know, um, you know, kind of tricks of the trade to help uh, help a little bit. But realistically, there's there's nothing that we're going to be able to do in the field to really help fix that. So uh, we have to, again, very, very painful. And, you know, you can't press, hold here, do this, do that to make it really feel much better. Um, so the paramedic might be able to help out with some medicine and things of that nature, but it just depends on blood pressure and how they, you know, how they're responding. And again, if they're, if they're bleeding internally or anything like that, but, uh, but again, it's one of those things that we really want to be cautious of, especially when we talk about lifting and moving patients is patients that have, uh, potential pelvic, uh, injuries. So the lower extremity, again, each lower extremity consists of the thigh and the leg that, uh, you know, has the, our, our biggest bone in our body, which is our femur, and it's the longest, strongest bone, like I said, in the body, and that helps provide, you know, structure for our legs. The, uh, again, those tibia and fibula make up the lower leg. The uh, kneecap patella is a small flat bone that protects the front of the knee joint, okay? So, again, we have fluid under there. We have, uh, you know, inside the knee joint, we have fluid, and, you know, again, our articulates right there. So we want to make sure that uh, the kneecap or the patella helps to uh, protect all that that's going on underneath there. The ankle and foot contain a large number of smaller bones. Like we said, for the foot, it would be um, tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges uh, for the for the foot. But however, huh, excuse me, however, you know, your ankle bone, which you would, you know, those two knobs that you see sticking out on either side of your ankle or the medial and lateral malleolus. Um, just, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to remember that, but that just gives you, you know, again, it gives you an idea. There's all sorts of different bones. Like I mentioned earlier, the calcaneus bone is your heel. So uh, a lot of other small bones uh, and more specific types of bones in, in these different areas, especially the areas that move and work a lot. Um, there's a lot of different smaller bones there. Excuse me. So the joints, uh, there are two bones that come into contact with each other. A joint is formed, uh, held together by tissues called tendons and ligaments. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So if you remember, tendons uh, hold uh, bones together, and ligaments usually hold, hold muscle to bone. Okay. Lubricated by a thin fluid that's contained in the sac surrounding the joint. And I've, I've had this actually happen to me before. I had my knee hit from the side and, and temporarily opened that, that fluid sac on the inside of my knee. And I had uh, what's called a Baker's cyst, you know, kind of it just the back of my knee just swole up. The rest of my knee wasn't too bad. The whole back of my knee uh, was, was puffy and full of fluid. And essentially all that lubricating fluid um, came out of that sac and, and, um, you know, relocated to the back of my knee. So, or in the, in the, in the tissue behind my knee. So, you know, that's, that's one, there's just, well, you know, a little, a little idea of how much fluid that can be is, you know, it's a pretty decent amount. So, um, you know, little things to look for, but that's one of those, that's one of those things that are, uh, very susceptible to injury are those joints. A couple of different types of joints we have, uh, or three three types fuse joints, the uh, hinge joint and the ball and socket joint. <coughs> Excuse me. The fuse joints, if you if you, and this is something too. If those of you who've ever been through CPR, all of you will during this class. But uh, if you if you look there in the top picture in blue, where you, that's a sternum and the ribs, that blue section there is actually more fused than it is uh, uh, fully connected, okay, or, or bone to bone, okay? So whenever you hear some of that crackling and popping, whenever we're doing CPR, that's actually going to be some of that, some of those little um, fusions separating, 
All right, it's not necessarily bones breaking. However, th that does happen occasionally, but majority of the time, if you're doing it correctly, you're separating some of those fuse joints. Okay, and that's going to give you, um, you know, of course, if you if you make it and you're, you 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 um, you recover from your your heart attack or whatever it is you're you're having while we're doing CPR, you're going to have. Um, you're going to have some chest pain for a while because of that, but nothing that you can't fix. Okay. So uh, that's one of those things where when you're doing that, just understand that it's probably going to happen. You're going to hear it. You're going to feel it. And, um, and it's not necessarily any more detrimental to the patient uh, than what they're going through at that time. Okay. So the uh, hinge joints, just like your elbow there. All right. <clears throat> Ball and socket would be like your hip. Okay. That's a, that's a, Probably the, the primary one is your hip and then your shoulder, okay? So skeletal muscles uh, provide support and movement. The alter, alternately contract and relax. The smooth muscles, also called involuntary muscles, uh, help with automatic function of the body. So as the nerves, you know, as your body, just as, as quick as your, your brain tells your body to, you know, put two fingers together, OK, um, you know, those smooth muscles are reacting and but the skeletal muscles are also reacting to, you know, contract those fingers together and relax them and things like that, just without you even having to uh, think about it. But there are some processes like, let's say, your heart and things like that, that are smooth muscle uh, that are cardiac, cardiac muscle. But you have other um, muscles throughout the body you know, in different body systems that just are automatically operating uh, because, because of the function that they have. But again, cardiac muscle is found only in the heart. So the nervous system governs the body's functioning. We mentioned this when we talked a little bit about the spinal cord and things of that nature. It's, um, you know, it really is what controls everything. Okay. Um, without that, you without the brain spinal cord those individual nerves throughout the body um you just don't feel okay you're without those nerves telling your bowels to move you don't have a bowel movement you don't urinate um you know you don't swallow you don't you know all these things are controlled by that um you know so every little thing that your body does is controlled by your brain and so whenever we have that's that's one of those things when we start seeing things misfire basically when things aren't working appropriately externally or internally that they can tell you about then we start looking at why why is that what area controls that what area of the brain controls that right what could cause that what externally could cause that to be happening uh, so that's when we start really kind of playing that detective role and start looking into our patient's history and what has happened to them, what's happened recently, what do they feel like recently, uh, what medicines do they take that might help, um, that might be causing some of that, okay? <clears throat> so essentially what we we're just talking about, peripheral nerves, uh, again, those nerves that are out there um, in our extremities that actually like I said, helped, you know, that are, that's the very end part uh, of our brain telling our fingers to come together is that peripheral nerve. Okay. The motor nerve to move, to, to muscle, to move the muscle in the forearm. Uh, you know, the spinal cord, like I said, you can kind of see it there. It's just going from the brain down to the spinal cord, down into the arm, that motor impulse telling the, telling those nerves in the arm to contract, um, you know, telling the fingers to contract, all those types of things are happening within milliseconds of each other uh, in order to ensure that that uh, is going to take place very quickly. So, again, when we start having, you know, bleeding in the brain, when we start having uh, blockages uh, and vessels in the brain uh, that control those areas um, of sensory function, then we're going to start to have issues and little things like strokes. Uh, TIAs, transient ischemic attacks, which we'll learn about later. Those are things that are um, that we start looking at as to reasons why certain things are happening. 
but just things as simple as blinking, smiling, uh, chewing, you know, breathing, all those things are controlled by uh, nerves. So the digestive system uh, breaks down food into a form that can be uh, carried by the circulation, circulatory system to the cells of the body. Uh, essentially just breaks it down into that into something that we can actually use at that level. <clears throat> you know, if you think about, you know, eating that cheeseburger or whatever, you know, we don't have little pieces of cheese floating around our circulatory system, right? But we do have microscopic pieces of that cheese uh, that have been broken down at the cellular level um, and we take away the nutrients. We also have some of the bad stuff, the fats and things of that nature that are uh, floating around in there as well. But food that is not used is eliminated and uh, so we, the body kind of takes what it wants from it and then it uh, then it gets rid of it or it stores some of it as fat and all that sort of stuff, right? Uh, major organs of the digestive system are located in the abdomen <clears throat> and in what we refer to as the four quadrants. Um, so we have a lot of different things in there. The digestive system as a whole starts at the throat or at the mouth, really. And so that's where we start to macerate those things. And we were, and we start the what we call peristalsis process, which is the the digestion of that food product down down uh, into a workable um, form that we can swallow it and then our stomach gives it uh, down the esophagus goes to our stomach that stomach provides it with some uh, acid uh, type mixture of bile and then a few other things provided by the gallbladder and things such as that and helps to break it down like i said to where that it can be digested into the small and large intestine. There, that way it kind of starts filtrating itself out into the bloodstream from, through that process. And then, um, like I said, it takes what it needs uh, through that process. And then it goes obviously down to the rectum and then out of the anus. Uh, those are all things, you know, that's kind of how that uh, process works. And that process essentially, the whole process is referred to as peristalsis. So as you can see here, we have several different things going on, um, you know, a lot of different things to remember. It's just one of those things you just need to memorize it, you know, look over things like this in your book. It probably has a, um, a medial lateral and an inferior, inferior, inferior superior um, plane, like, an, like a, <clears throat> a plus sign drawn on the abdomen or I mean, on the, uh, yeah, on the abdomen. And it'll have the different things that are located in each one of those quadrants. I would make some notes of those, copy those down, make sure you understand what's in each quadrant. Uh, that's key for when we start doing our patient assessments. You know, when patients are telling you, oh, I have pain right here, right? And you, t and, and you say, okay, point to where it's at. All right, you need to know what's around there, okay? What, what is, what's in that area that we need to be concerned about? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so of course injuries, any type of, you know, open wound, anything of that nature, we want to know what's underneath there. We need to know where we're sticking our finger. We need to know, you know, where we're holding, what we're holding pressure on. Um, it's important to know those things, uh, for obvious reasons. But, uh, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas are, are, are some of the main organs that are in that di digestive organs that are in there. The, uh, as you can see there. The transverse colon, as it kind of implies, is transverse, so it's kind of going across the body. Descending colon is going down. Ascending colon is going uh, up, transverse, descending, right? So up, over, and down. Uh, that's the larger part, the large intestine. And then our small intestine is there, um, essentially it's called the jejunum. And the that part is, um, you know, when you have... Uh, a lot of your process is taking place in that small intestine before it gets to your large intestine. Excuse me. So genitourinary system, the 
responsible for the body's reproductive functions and the removal of waste products. You know, it's uh, you know, it's, you know, always not not the easiest to to talk about with your friends, right? About all this type of stuff. But however, for those of us in the medical field, regardless of what your level is, um, you know, this is something that you have to deal with. Okay, so it's funny to snicker and play and and poke fun about it or whatever. But realistically, you know, our waste, our reproductive system, things like that can tell you a whole lot about a patient, uh, especially somebody who's really sick. Uh, you know, these things will, are affected as well. Um, our digestive system and, and our waste uh, system and reproductive systems uh, are affected as, and can really kind of tell part of the story that we need to get. <clears throat> So again, major reproductive organs, obviously testes produce sperm and the penis delivers a sperm uh, in the male. Females, uh, the ovaries produce eggs. Uh, the uterus holds a fertilized egg during pregnancy and the egg released by the ovaries travels through the uter to the uterus and through the fallopian tubes. Uh, the external opening of the female reproduces reproductive system is called the birth canal or the vagina. Um, so just understand that, you know, there's a lot of other issues and we're going to get into, um, you know, childbirth and pregnancy related issues uh, later in class. But this is um, definitely there's a lot of things that can go wrong here with that process, uh, both the male and female. OK. So the removal of waste products begins in the kidneys, which filter the blood to form urine. Uh, again, it takes that runs that blood through a, essentially a filter, right? So it it uh, has several different uh, phases of filtration, and it will uh, filter that filter the blood through there, keeps the good blood, and keeps moving it throughout the body. And then the urine obviously is all those toxins that get trapped in there, get rotated down uh, through the ureters and into the bladder, and then from the bladder it collects and stores the urine and passes out of the body. Um, when it, when the nerve, when the urinary nerve tells it to, okay. So when that ur urinary nerve, uh, you know, basically essentially hits a little alarm and says, Hey, that's enough for me. I got to go. And that's when you get that. Oh, oh I got to go pee pee feeling. Okay. That you've had since you were a child. So that's essentially what that means. <clears throat> So we'll take uh, take about ten minutes. To come back. We we probably have uh, not too many more. We we'll have we have several more slides though, and uh, we'll get through tonight. But uh, let's take ten minutes and, and be back.
All right, everybody, get back to it. So, <clears throat> talking about the skin, the uh, you know the skin plays a, a vital role in uh, in a lot of body processes. A lot of people think, oh, it just covers the skin and stuff like that, but really, it helps to uh, you know helps regulate our temperature, hot and cold. You know, moves uh moves a lot of things. Uh, I'm sorry, it it really protects a lot of the things that we uh, that we need uh, to happen in our body. So a lot of that stuff we're talking about about you know exchanging uh, blood and all that other sort of stuff throughout the body. It really helps protect that. Obviously, it protects us against all the different substances out there. So that's why you can go swimming and all sorts of different things and not, you know, not get into your bloodstream uh, quite as easy. It still can, you know, but it's it makes it much harder uh, for it to do that. <clears throat> but all the different things that, that you come into contact with, you know, rubbing up against stuff and, and um, you know, you think about all the things we do at work and play and all that sort of stuff uh especially as children you know we, we get into a lot of things and that skin really does help to uh to help protect that so it also we have a lot of nerve endings you know that really helps to um you know it's our our touchy feely you know sensory you know part uh as well so that gives us our gives the brain some indication as to hey that's hot this is cold this is um you know the, the fine little fine motor skills that we need in order to uh, do work uh, to do certain tasks um, that are very minute, right? So the dermis is the deeper or inner layer of the skin, and uh, the epidermis is the outer layer of the skin, which is located upon the dermis. So it's laying on top. So the epidermis is laying on top of the dermis. So you can see here, this is a pretty common um, representation of skin that they that they use. So you can see the hairs of the silica laying there. Um, I'm sorry, standing up there. And then you have so you have the epidermis, which is that that first uh, at top first layer there. And then you have the dermis and the subcutaneous layer. So when we get into burns, this is going to be something that we refer back to. So again, in any of these things, especially a lot of these uh, little pictures and diagrams that you see here and the ones in your books, you really need to be studying those and trying to get a, a, a visual picture in your mind as to where these things are um, in their structure. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be really important when we start looking at, you know, wound patterns, injuries, illnesses, that sort of thing as to as to how that it's going to really affect um, that. Um, you know, that specific, you know, body system. So epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous. And then, of course, you have the different vessels running through there that give it blood, right? So we talk about capillaries might uh, be down there at the smaller level on uh, the fingertips and all that sort of stuff to give uh, and up to the smaller layers of the skin to give it that uh, the nutrients that it needs to, to be healthy. So you have the pores on top of the skin. Obviously, we have the hair follicles that... Uh, kind of like the roots that start way down there and come all the way out. Again, the, the we talked we just talked about nerves, the uh the nerves the nerve endings are, are all over the place there. Sweat glands, uh those sweat the glands help to cool the skin. Uh you know that uh, obviously right now while it's so hot and everybody's sweating all, every day. Uh, just riding around the vehicle with the air conditioner on, you still sweat sometimes and then you have uh so that that helps to uh, again cool the skin down and regulate help regulate your body temperature. So we mentioned this a second ago about you know perceiving or sensing you know things. So touch, pressure, pain, degrees of hot or cold, uh, all vital things to our survival, right? So stages of life, uh, the growth and development, just again, we're going to touch on this a little bit. We'll, we'll, we'll go through a lot more of this later on. Um, in an infant, the airway is very small. So when you have a, a, an actual, you know, small child or infant, um, you know, it's easily obstructed by swelling or by objects, especially children want to put things in their mouth. <clears throat> so because toddlers have uh, poor coordination and balance, they're at a higher risk for falls. 
Uh, so they're trying to get into things. They're trying to climb on things. Everything is new to them. You know, they're constantly learning and evolving as to what their body can and can't do. Uh, so they usually have a lot of errors in that, which uh, kind of comes out into a, a fall or trip or, you know, something of that nature, right? School-age children are physically active and prone to injuries, uh, bicycle riding, other mis athletic mishaps. They're, try again, trying different things, uh, going different places, uh, you know, that uh, as they as they get bigger and stronger and uh, more coordinated, they're, they're, again, taking that level up a little bit. And so usually they're riding things, they're on scooters and four-wheelers and you know, a lot of different things. So those of you that are around this county, you know, we've seen several, in, you know, children injured on ATVs and bicycles and other motorized things, you know, here recently. And so, you know, that's definitely one of those that uh, is, a, is an audience that um, or a genre of, of age group there that we have uh, a lot of injuries with. So adolescents uh, do not fully understand the consequences of dangerous actions. You know, a lot of times they, you know, they, they get to going fast and they either are really scared and don't want to do it at all, or they're very excited about it. It's, it's new and different that they get to go fast. They don't understand what happens when you suddenly stop, however. So they don't get that part. Um, early adulthood is the period when most body systems are fully developed. Uh, middle adulthood is generally the time when body systems start to decline. And then during ad late adulthood, the decline becomes more pronounced. So that's when you have a lot of your, um, you know, diagnosis for, you know, different body system, you know, illnesses that kind of start to come to fruition. They may have been there, but they, they weren't, you know, uh, detrimental to everyday life. And that's where the medical community, like the actual like doctors and surgeons and all that stuff, specialists, specialists start. Uh, that's when that's what they refer to when they when they start treating patients uh, is a lot of times is they treat their how detrimental it is to their everyday life. So, you know, a lot of times if you have a back injury, if you can still get up, bend over, tie your shoes, you know, walk around, that sort of thing. You know, to a back specialist, you're doing pretty good. You know, they're, you know even though you may have a little pain here and there, they're really not worried about it. So. Um, so again, if, if the more that it affects your daily um, your daily life, the you know you're able to to care for yourself, clean, cook clean, um, take care of your your own body, you know, um, utilize the bathroom, you know, cook for yourself, those types of things. Um, the more they will uh, usually start to, uh, the more serious they start to take those those issues. So we mentioned vital signs earlier, and again, we're going to get a lot more into this later on, but this uh, just kind of, again, a, a laying a foundation so that you kind of understand what we're talking about going forward, okay? So this chapter really is pretty important for you to go back and read, especially in your book, and get a little bit more details from your book and your text about, uh, about, about some of these things. Uh, most commonly measured vital signs is a pulse of the heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. These are the three ones that we'll concentrate on. And again, when we get to skills lab, we're going to talk a, a good bit more about them. Um, you know, when we get to skills lab, we'll, we'll definitely, you know, do all these things and let you put hands on, take a bunch of blood pressures and all that sort of stuff. Normal vital signs change with age and condition and, you know, illnesses and injuries and all sorts of different stuff, you know, cause uh, vital signs to kind of fluctuate here and there. Uh, normal pulse and respiratory rates decrease, systolic blood pressure increases. Um, so systolic and blood pressure, you have systolic and diastolic, that's your number. So you know, those of you, I'm sure most of you probably had your blood pressure taken before. And let's say you have 120 over 80, right? So 120 is systolic, the 80 is diastolic. So that's always read that way. It is systolic first, diastolic next. Um, and that's how it's written out, systolic over diastolic. So 120 over 80, you know, would be in that, which it's actually changed, but that used to be the textbook um, blood pressure, you know, for, for the average adult. <clears throat> so looking at this uh, table, you can kind of see here, typical vital sign values based on age. Uh, our infants and newborns, their heart rate is always gonna be higher just naturally. 
again, their tiny little body only has to circulate a tiny little distance. Okay. Uh, for those of us that are six foot tall and taller, you know, we have six feet plus of distance to circulate. So it's a little bit different. So again, as you can see there in the pulse rate, 90 to 180 for an infant child, a little bit less, 70 to 150, and then adults, 60 to 100. That's for the, that's for the pulse rate. So again, we talked about pulse locations, uh, typically for, uh, typically in most patients, we're going to check pulses in the radial pulse or right there, just south of the thumb. Okay. So we want our hand down, down the thumb. All right. And we feel a little notch in our wrist. Uh, that little area right there, if we don't put too much pressure, light pressure with like our second or third uh, phalange, our finger, and we can uh, we can feel our pulse and our radial pulse, okay? So we can check that pulse obviously in the, uh, the carotid pulse as well. But if we have, typically, and this is another G whiz thing, if you feel a pulse, that radial pulse right there, any, any pulse at all, if you feel a pulse, motion there you're going to have a blood pressure of at least 80 okay so that's just a kind of a gee whiz thing if you have a pulse in the wrist you have a blood pressure of at least 80 that's just a, again a rough um you know kind of thing to remember you know in, in, on the fly if you don't have a whole lot to to be able to assess with and you check that and you kind of have a general idea um about their their blood pressure so going over to respirations or breaths per minute, again, how many times does that chest rise and fall per minute? Okay, that's, that's all we're doing. That's all we're counting. So now we'll get into, get into some of these later. We'll talk about breathing rate and quality. Uh, so how, how is the pulse rate? How, you know, how does it, uh, is it bounding? Is it real weak and thready? You know, these types of things, these descriptive things, we're going to talk about what that means. And same way with respirations. Do we have different sounds? Um, you know, is it uh, labored breathing? You know, is it short uh, breathe, you know, breaths? Uh, you know, all these different things mean something. Okay. So we're going to get into that later. But just in general, talking about the values here. It's the breaths per minute for infants, 25 to 60. Again, same thing. They breathe a little bit faster. Uh, children, knock it down 15 to 30. And then adults, 12 to 20. Okay. <clears throat> Moving over to blood pressure. Uh, however, again, our blood pressure doesn't have to be quite as much for our infants. Okay. Again, their circulatory system is just doesn't require that much because it doesn't have that far to go. All right. So 50 to 95. Excuse me. Uh, 50 over 95 is your um, systolic blood pressure. I'm sorry. This is just systolic, so not the diastolic number. So systolic blood pressure, 50 to 95, 80 to 110 systolic blood pressure for your children. And then adults is 90 to 140 uh, just for the systolic number. Okay. Systolic over diastolic. So some of the factors that can, you know, vary in here or make things, make some variables in that, um, in those vital signs uh, can be, you know, exercise, fever. And of course, you know, if you go for a run, right, you, you come, you're going to have a high heart rate. You're just going to be, you know, jumping out of your neck, you know, um, you, you, you'll feel it in your throat. Some people say, or whatever, you know, you feel like your heart's pounding out of your chest. You just did a bunch of sprints, right? So, <clears throat> Uh, fever, illness, pain, uh, stress, excess body weight, abuse of illegal drugs, you know, tons of these things can increase it. Uh, some of the things that can decrease it, athletic conditioning, blood pressure medications, abuse of illegal drugs. So it just depends on which ones you take, uppers, downers, you know, different types of medicines and medications can cause it to uh, to go up or down. Uh, but again, if you're really fit and athletic, you know, you're blood pressure may be a little lower and, uh, you know, more stabilized, right? So plenty of other factors besides that. These are just some of the ones that, you know, to be concerned with, you know, a lot of times when we talk about what can we do, what can we really do as first responders? Oh, I'm just a first responder. I, don't, I can't do much. 
you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that we can use the patient's own body to help itself out. You know, little things like breathing. If you'll slow a patient's breathing rate down, just calming them down, having them breathe, having them breathe a certain way will help to, uh, you know, help reduce pain, you know, some anxiety. It'll help bring their heart rate down, blood pressure will come down, respiratory rate comes down, and it, it will have a, a, an outlying effect on things that are going on. It'll help to reduce pain. It'll help to reduce that, like I said, that anxiety and things of that nature, uh, which in turn will really just, you know, help your patient in the long run uh, with whatever with whatever's going on. So little things like that can, can have a big outcome. All right, I know we covered a whole ton of stuff tonight. Like I said, big thing, need you to review your um need you to review your your books, okay, read your chapters and uh and make sure that you're looking at those those different tables that are in your book uh that have that outline your um uh some of those structures and different different things that are out there for um you know, those graphics that show you, you know, some of those pictures and things that outline different parts of the body, uh, sections of the body, those organs, bones, all those different things. You need to be essentially memorizing them. All right. That's, you know, that's, only, that's really the only way you're going to have to kind of go about doing that. And um, again, tons of other resources out there. Uh, of course, your book is just one of them. But, you know, blood flow through the heart. We kind of ran through that pretty quick. There's some great little, like I said, videos and graphics out there that'll help show you in real time how it how it flows through the heart. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, there's ones that have dissections of the heart, and you can kind of see what they actually really look like, what the valves look like. We didn't really touch too much on valves, um, bicuspid, tricuspid valves, you know, things of that nature. But, um, you know, again, just an overview of a lot of different things tonight. So kind of get your feet wet on the medical side. Uh, you know, from here on out, it's it, it's uh, it's both feet in the water um, with the medical stuff. OK, so, um, you know, class kind of kind of starts now. OK, I need you to guys to, you know, kind of dig in, um, ask questions. You know, if you have questions later on, that you, you know, when you're studying, or you're, you're looking over stuff, please write them down and ask them when we come back to class or, or hit me up whenever. But, um, you know, make sure you're utilizing your resources. And, um, you know, make sure those of you, like I said earlier, if you haven't, if you haven't got on Canvas and done your quizzes, you need to go ahead and do that. Okay. Especially if you're behind, you need to go ahead and try to catch up and, uh, and get your stuff knocked out. Okay. So with that, anybody got any questions? No, sir. All right. Um, yes. So this Thursday, uh, same time, same channel, uh, next Thursday, you may have a different instructor potentially. Um, I have to go out of town, but, uh, we'll have another instructor probably be on with you, uh, going over that chap, those chapters as well. So again, if you need anything, feel free to hit me up. Let me know what you need. Uh, I'll be glad to help you out. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at some things and it's just not making sense, or you're not really sure what it means or whatever, by all means, let us know so we can uh, we can help kind of keep you in that right path. OK. All right. That's all I got for you guys tonight. I sure appreciate it. And uh, you guys have a good one. Class right. number. Huh? Class number. Class number. Yes. Yes. R. <laughs> Zero, 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 three. R zero 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 three, correct? That's it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. There you go. Oh, the button.